You can have a really great product. It tastes fabulous. It performs well, solid nutrition. But if it's at a price point that people aren't going to buy it, it's going to sit on the shelf. Um, and so how do you balance this, this cost, nutrition, and, and really like I, I like to call it a compromise. Mm -hmm. You know, we start with everything. Here's, here's what we want, all of this. Um, and then at the end of the day, can we achieve that? And if we can't, what are we willing to, to compromise on? Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Pet Food Science Podcast. I'm our host, Dr. Julia Pazali, and today I have the pleasure of having Dr. Stephanie Clark with us to talk about product development in the pet food industry. Welcome, Stephanie, to our podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. No problem. Our pleasure. And before we talk about product development, do you mind sharing with our audience uh, your background and how you ended up in your current position today? Yeah, it's a little bit of a colorful background. Um, it, it's a little unorthodox how I got here. Um, so like every little Midwestern girl who has a, a favorite cat or dog, I wanted to be a veterinarian. Um, went to a technician school and then a four-year degree and then was going to go to vet school and then found out that um, I like to research better. Um, some days I question that if I made the right choice into research versus vet med, but um, went and got my master's. I was actually going to do uh, marine biology and I was looking at some biomarkers in the blood. Unfortunately, lost my funding and had to restart my master's from scratch, um, which then I started in toxicology. Was loving it. Everything was great. Uh, came down to my PhD and I decided to pursue one school. And if one school wanted to have me, then it was meant to be. Um, but I had switched my major from toxicology to nutrition. Um, I thought it was a little less grim. Um, <laughs> little did I know how passionate nutrition can be. Um, so did my po or did my PhD um, in animal nutrition, and then went and worked for um, a large corporation in pet food for about a year. Realized I missed research. Um, so I ended up doing my postdoc at the Mayo Clinic uh, up in Rochester, Minnesota, where I spent a couple of years there researching, um, studying the welfare of dogs, uh, making sure that the dogs that go and visit all the people in the hospital um, enjoy their job and, and like their life. Um, there was a lot of reports of like GI upset after the visit, um, which can indicate stress sometimes. So after my postdoc, um, I went and did some clinic work, working as a clinical nutrition um, technician. And, you know, one day I got a, a random message on LinkedIn and it was Nate Thomas, the, uh, the co-founder of BSM Partners. And he said, hey, are you still looking for a job? Um, and today actually marks my five year anniversary here, though. So <laughs> um, dare I say it's it's my dream job. I get to do a lot of things, um, research, nutrition, product innovation, um, and really the sky is the limit, which I, I love doing a lot of things all at once. Um, so I don't get bored, but since then I've, uh, I've sat for my boards. And so I'm a board certified companion animal nutritionist, um, and a diplomat in nutrition. And then also sat for my vet tech specialty, um, so I have a vet tech specialty in nutrition and then continued on with my education as a certified food scientist. So <laughs> here I am after all of that education, um, you know, and really enjoying where I am in, in life and, and all the opportunities that I have here. Leading pet food manufacturers, renderers, and ingredient suppliers recognize that Kemen is assurance. Every day they deliver specialized expertise, innovative products, and unrivaled support through the pet food and rendering value chain. From oxidation control and food safety to palatability and nutrition, all the way through a suite of tailored services that allow you to feel supported from start to finish to ensure you're getting the most from Kemen ingredients. That's why every step of the way, Kemen Nutrisurance is your partner in pet food and rendering ingredients. That's awesome, man. You feel like research, understanding how you like the flexibility in your work and 
how much different things you get to do because usually whoever likes research they like to do many things at the same time yeah. and different things so it seems like a great fit and you mentioned that you have a lot of nutrition background but also as you are a certified food scientist mm -hmm. uh, so when you talk about product development as a nutritionist sometimes people only think about it's just formulating get the paper to a product can you talk a little bit about the complexity about product development and how it's much more than simply nutrition. Yeah, absolutely. Which is why I wanted to do my certified food scientist um, education. You know, when working in a clinic, you're working with one animal and you can design a diet that they take home and they make. And you really can control a lot of the ingredients. Um, while commercially, that's not the case. And, and you really have to be able to scale it up. So you need to make something that's nutritionally sound, that it's going to um, work food science wise in a factory, um, depending on which plant you're working at. But then also, you know, the benchtop testing. Does it look like you want it to look? Does it taste like you want it to taste? And are the nutrition, you know, aspects that you put on paper actually what's coming out? And I, I think a lot of the times there's this huge disconnect between what we think is going to come out and what actually comes out because, you know, nutrients are so variable from ingredient to ingredient. As you said, I think just the variability ingredient is so hard us to make the precision nutrition sometimes that we target in a commercial application. Um, and for all these complexities, food, uh, food science as well, right? How to, those ingredients, they not only provide nutrition, but how they interact in a specific food matrix to form the kibo, to form the canned food or different formats. And from your um, experience so far, how many different types of products have you helped uh, develop? Yeah, so lots of different formulas, um, lots of different types. So, you know, kibble and extruded and baked. I've also done um, wet, whether it's, you know, canned or a broth. Um, or chunks and gravy or stew. And then definitely started going into freeze dried and air dried and done some raw a little bit. Um, obviously there's a little bit of tricky things with that. So it's not as common, um, but really have experienced a lot of different types. Um, and then in the supplement and treats, you know, soft treats or semi-moist treats, um, harder treats or crunchy treats. Um, and then different supplements, whether it's been powder or uh, a semi-moist chew or a tablet even, um, or even in different formats that, you know, have, have never been created before. Yeah. And that's for me, what's fascinating about the pet food industry is it's, you cannot get bored if a product development, because there's so many formats and so many uh, new formats coming up, coming out as well, coming, mimicking human food, different aspects. Um, before I talk about the supplements that I'm very interested in, in hearing from you, yeah. um, more on the traditional pet food formats, which are usually extruded diets and canned diets. Uh, what is nowadays a lot of the innovation that is coming in? And when I think about new ingredients that people are trying to create or new claims, uh, what are those trends? And maybe if you want to talk a little bit of the challenges and introduce some of these uh, new trends uh, from your perspective. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um... When you think about trends, you're trying to to address the pet owner's wants, mm -hmm. um, but still not disregarding what the pet needs. Um, so right now, a few really popular things are, are functional ingredients or functional foods. Um, you know, trying to get your supplement and your your dog's food or your cat's food all in one bowl. So um, functional ingredients in the kibble, you know, people are trying to get the most bang for their buck, especially now with, you know, petflation. And so really trying to put functional ingredients in there at efficacious amounts that are safe for, you know, a smaller dog or a larger dog. Um, and then right now, a really popular trend that I'm seeing is um, no synthetic vitamins and minerals, um, which definitely adds a layer of complexity. Yeah. Uh, like we had talked about, nutrients and ingredients are so variable. Um, very little people do it because it is so hard, um, but it does, you know, it's, it's novel. It puts you out there, you know, pet owners like to see non-synthetic. Um, again, nothing wrong with synthetic. Um, it just seems to be a topic that is popping up a lot more um, as of late. 
Yeah, and educating consumers is also a challenge because, as you said, there's nothing wrong published scientifically to prove that they're going to be harmful in a long term. But at the same time, if you want to be competitive in the market, you have to think about success, being the product being successful. Otherwise, it doesn't matter if it provides the most nutrition, but uh, different layers of complexity, as we've been talking about. Uh, and the functional ingredients has been a very popular trend and novel ingredients. So people are trying to differentiate themselves using different ingredients. So uh, as a product development, uh, product developer, when you have a company or someone reaching out to have this ingredient that want to include a specific formula, from where do you start? What should you be looking first? If it's an ingredient that you never heard about, never worked with? Yeah, so it, it depends, right? Um, is, is this ingredient something that is approved for use in, in cats and dogs? Is it safe for cats and dogs? Um, or is this just a new ingredient for that brand or that type of format? And so depending on which kind of avenue you're starting with, if you're starting with the, is it safe question, you know, really doing um, a safety study and getting that food approval, whether it's a, a protein source or an additive or, um, you know, another fat source, really doing that study. It, it takes time. It costs money. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, to have that evidence to say, yes, this is safe in dogs or cats or kittens or puppies is really foundational to putting it into a formula. So if it's brand new, never been used, not AFCO approved, not grass, you know, that's the avenue you have to start with first. If it is AFCO approved or grass, um, you know, then you're starting to look at is there any evidence in cats and dogs that this can be fed safely? Um, you know, you kind of go back to, you know, raisins. Raisins are safe for humans, but when you start wanting to add them into pet food, maybe not the best, you know, novel ingredient. So really trying to figure out, is it safe? And if it is safe, what is the most appropriate amount? Um, you know, you don't want to add in you know, 10, 15% beet pulp, and you're like, everything is great. You know, it looks great on paper. And then you've got a dog who is having some issues with some back end performance. So really optimizing the inclusion in the formula, how it's going to act again, like you said, with the matrix, the other ingredients in there. Um, and can it even go through and survive? So postbiotic, I'm sorry, probiotics are very popular. We like to see them on our label but you'll never see them in a wet. Uh, you'll never see them in a can. You can put them in there, but they won't be there when you're done cooking it. So, you know, is it, yeah. is it the right ingredient for the right manufacturing process? A different processing, as you said, even the non-synthetic uh, um, vitamins is how they're going to be being lost, not only doing processing, but also shelf life. Absolutely. The product sometimes has to be there for a long time. So I think product development doesn't end when you get a nice product, nice uh, or ideal nutritional composition is it's going to be there for a long time. So what's going to happen in 12 months or even even more? So uh, very complex for sure. So just do you have any um, um, maybe challenges to share with uh, these noble proteins or uh, noble ingredients or different trends? Uh, for those new formats or not new formats, the traditional ones that usually you face when you're developing products? Yeah, so with, with a novel ingredient, you know, completely novel to pet food, it's it's the cost. Um, you know, the cost of entry is what I like to say. You know, going through that time to do the study, the cost that, it, you know, it acquires to actually perform the study and then present it to the FDA that's a long process. And a lot of people are like, Hey, I have this idea. How quickly can we get to launch? Which is totally understandable. Um, so that can be challenging. Sometimes you're, you're pushed against, you know, resources, time and, and cash flow. Um, another thing is how does this feed? You know, it may be a really great protein source that maybe has a really bad taste or maybe it reacted to something um, or maybe, you know, reacted to something within the product originally. And so that may be giving it an off flavor, um, or even an off color. And it, you know, it puts yeah. pet owners at a little bit more like, ah, do I still want to buy this? It was this nice Brown. Maybe it's now like a dingy Brown or green. And, you know, some pet owners aren't liking that. Um, so really trying to understand how this is going to function 
what are the the pros and the cons behind it and you know even with functional ingredients I like to add a few functional ingredients in because I never like to rely on just one functional ingredient and put all my claims in you know one basket essentially or one bag um, but then that starts affecting the cost and you can have a really great product it tastes fabulous it performs well solid nutrition but if it's at a price point that people aren't going to buy it it's going to sit on the shelf um, and so how do you balance this this cost nutrition and, and really like I, I like to call it a compromise. Mm -hmm. You know, we start with everything. Here's, here's what we want, all of this. Um, and then at the end of the day, can we achieve that? And if we can't, what are we willing to, to compromise on? And sometimes it's even the effect, um, simple effects on the animal. I was reading a paper, they were testing a different protein source and the feces became kind of greenish. So then the pet owner thinks something is wrong with it, but it's not. Yeah. So it's sometimes it's those small aspects that sometimes you don't think about, but is I if I see my stool of my cat or dog that is different color, you're gonna think something is wrong with the diet. And it's nothing wrong, but it's maybe a specific compound color that is not digested. But uh it's those very small aspects that end up making a huge difference uh in making a product success successful or not. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> And a lot of um, new product come is coming as supplements and treats. Uh, there's a huge growth in supplements, more than dry and canned food, even though there is still the biggest share of the market. Uh, you mentioned that you did a lot of development of different types of supplements and also treats, such as the soft chews, uh, freeze dry, can be complete and balanced. But um, for in the supplement market, what do you think is the biggest innovation and maybe different challenges as you face, as they are usually not complete and balanced as some of the more traditional formats. So do you want to give any insights of different challenges that you face when you're uh, developing those supplements or treats? Yeah, it's definitely challenging. Um, I've been working on them for, you know, six plus years, seven plus years. And every supplement comes with its own challenges. And, and it can be you know, how do we make this tasty? Because unfortunately, you know, a lot of functional ingredients aren't very tasty. Um, you know, turmeric, for example, I did a lot of research on that. Dogs don't like it. It, it. They don't, they don't love the taste. The owners don't love the orange color, but it has some really neat benefits if you can get it in the animal. Um, you know, so making sure something is really tasty, but then also is the dosage appropriate? If you think about these supplements on the markets, it's not a it's not a small breed supplement and a large or giant breed supplement. It's a dental supplement or a gut health supplement. And so really making sure that if a 10 pound dog were to eat the supplement, it would have just as you know efficacious results as if a 110 pound dog is going to eat this. So there's challenges with you know, how broad. Cats are a little bit more closer in weight, so it's not so, so challenging. But again, you're going to have, you know, some of your larger cats and smaller cats. Um, and a lot of these efficacious or functional ingredients are on a, a MIGS per kg body weight. So it's really focused on body weight. Um, you know, another thing is, you know, in the veterinary community, there's a 10%, you know, no more than 10% of your calories should be, you know, treats and supplements and other than a complete and balanced food. So how do you deliver these functional ingredients in a, in a, you know, a tiny little pack that's not very calorie dense? Um, you'll see a lot of like dental chews, they struggle with high calories. And so if you think about like, I'm gonna give my dog a, a dental treat did we just wipe out its entire daily caloric intake in one treat, <laughs> you know, and then with obesity, you know, it just keeps rising and rising. Is, is that something we're going to butt up against? So how do we get a dental treat that's going to be efficacious, tasty, but also healthy calorie wise for the dog or the cat? Um, so there's a lot of challenges that come in with supplements and a lot of checking, you know, depending on your claims, do you have the evidence to substantiate that? Or do we need to do a clinical trial to substantiate those claims? And then again, it's more time and money. But at the end of the day, 
you know, supplements aren't really regulated. And so they have a lot of like pretty ingredients on them, but that doesn't mean that they're functional. Um, so again, it's, it's really hard for the pet owner to, you know, pick up a supplement and really understand those claims and say, okay, I know this, this brand did their, their research, they did their due diligence and they put the best that they could in this chew or powder. Um, so it, it really, it gets a lot, a lot of challenges, but it doesn't mean it's impossible, right? Um, you know, we do have really great supplements out on the market in all different forms. Um, it's just really considering, you know, what do you want out of it? And, and is it right for your individual animal? And it can be very overwhelming for the pet owner, you know, go to the shelf. There's so many products and with probiotics and gut health being a very popular trend, there's so many, you know, probiotic products. And there's some research showing that some are highly variable. They are definitely not all the same. Some have some, um, they're not meeting specific standards they're supposed to. So it's, there's a lot of new products coming out and it's very important to make sure uh, you trust which one you're buying and doing your research as well, because there's uh, sometimes that innovation is really going, in my opinion, sometimes way too fast. And then to meet all those claims, uh, it can be challenging as well. And to, to prove them, it uh, can become more challenging even. Yeah. And when in doubt, you know, just call the brand, um, ask them, you know, palatability studies, digestibility studies. Do you have, you know, any, substantiation on these claims and you know the brand should be forthcoming and and share that information with you so i mean when in doubt just just call the brand um and ask them yeah and i think educating consumers is a big part of it as well as you said the size of dogs and then the usually the uh, even for requirements is always going to be in a body weight basis but for supplements or specific uh targeting those is very important to meet those uh, specific uh dosages to achieve uh, the outcome you want uh, and also making sure that people are not overfeeding because then you can unbalance the ratio of minerals unbalance all the ratio of other nutrients that are going to be important to maintain health so sometimes people buy they're in a uh, specific diet for joint health or it has very high omega-3 and then you put more joint health supplements you may create another problem there so it's so much going on in the industry and educating consumers is important to make sure uh, they have the the knowledge necessary to not overfeed or to to make the right choices for their pet. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, uh, one of my last question is, um, as um, a lot of those supplements and treats, they're not going to be complete and balanced because they're not intended for it. But many are. So, as a nutritionist, do you have any, uh, I would say, recommendation maybe to pr- formulate treats that are complete and balanced when people ask you, and some advantages of it. Yeah, so it definitely, again, it adds another layer of complexity, um, but not impossible. And so really taking something that is, you know, calorie balanced and efficacious and now adding vitamins and minerals on top of that, you know, making sure those vitamins and minerals survive whatever process they're going through. Um, the, and I would say the good thing is, you know, you're not as likely to unbalance the diet um, because you are adding in those vitamins and minerals that you could be diluting out with, you know, a, a calorically rich treat or supplement. However, the downfall, and maybe this is just me, you know, seeing it from a different perspective is, are you providing the animal with too much vitamins and minerals? Um, you know, if you are fortifying this treat, um, or the supplement, with all the vitamins and, and minerals necessary, and you don't account for a dog that may be on a fish diet, you know, what is the total vitamin D that this animal is getting? You know, is it within AFCO max? Because the, the AFCO max definitely has gone down and it's made things a lot harder. Um, and, and so what is the actual amount of vitamin D that dog is getting or that cat is getting from the supplement and then how much from the diet and then is it safe together? And that's, that's really hard. Um, It's hard for us scientists to make sure, I mean, because we can't put the supplement against every single brand and diet out there and say, does it work for everyone? Mm -hmm. And it's imagining it's even harder for pet owners who 
don't frequently read the AFCO book or, you know, they're not up to speed that vitamin D changed and, you know, your salmon diet may be a little high in vitamin D or, you know, what kind of testing are they doing? So I think it's, it's got its pros, but it's again, one of those double-edged swords, like depending on what is really going into that supplement, um, you know, is it beneficial or is it more harm? Yeah. And even the human food industry have this follow cast fortification since the late uh, 90s, I think. And people are questioning now, is too much folic acid? And then in that case, vitamin D, you're going to see a, a excess or a toxicity kind of quick. But folic acid is not something you see in the next generation or you're changing the DNA methylation. So it's all... <laughs> It becomes very complex, and you see this in yeah. the human industry of this folic acid fortification that we don't know the consequences. We're changing then the gene expression, the epigenetics of entire population. They're eating specific bread, flour, so uh, it's for sure very complex. And even analysis, vitamin D is I know it's variable as well. Analysis, laboratories, and um, it's not only deficiency excess can be very detrimental as well. Is that bell sh uh, bell shape curve that? Uh, <laughs> the middle is where we want to be or the optimal at least or uh, nutrition, which is going to be a little bit. Yeah. Last question on the product development. Do you, uh, that's, I'm sure you, that's a question that nobody wants to hear, but from start to end, from a brand new idea and product, how long does it usually take to see that idea on the shelf? Yeah, that's a really good question. We get asked that a lot. Um, and I sound so much like a nutritionist when I say it, it depends. Um, mm -hmm. But ideally you're looking at, you know, eight or nine months from ideation to, you know, getting a product, of course, along the way, depending on how many iterations, um, sometimes the formulation process. So what I like to do is, you know, I like to formulate with my clients. So they're, we're getting real time feedback to try and shorten that process. Um, but depending on, you know, what the cost may come out as, or is there a shortage in an ingredient? We're seeing a lot of that, you know, even now, um, a few years past COVID, the supply chain just isn't what it used to be. And so prices fluctuate, supply fluctuates, and, you know, then you have packaging. What packaging do you want to do? Does it, does it work with the commands machinery? Um, and then what kind of claims do you want to do? So you can see it like starts adding on. Um, and so everyone's like, can I turn this around, you know, in a couple of months, yeah. you can turn a formula around in a couple of months, but you may not have packaging for another six or eight weeks. Um, what's your market or go to market strategy? You know, are you trying to get in to a place? Um, do you already have shelves? Are you going e-commerce and how long does that take to set all of that up? Um, I'm learning as I am expanding more and more, that's a pretty complex process. Um, you know, what it takes to get on Amazon even. Um, it's it's not just a flip of a switch, like we can go on Amazon and we hit, okay, add to cart. The, the back end is so much work um, and making sure that your products are where they need to be with who they need to be. So, I mean, roughly tentatively eight to nine months, um, but again, depending on, you know, feasibilities and packaging, you know, right now we have uh, co-manufacturers or contract manufacturers availability um, and their willingness to do a benchtop trial. Um, so when can we get in for a benchtop trial to test the, the product before we go into a line production? And so that can always add extra months, <laughs> really. Um, you think, oh, well, they have all this capacity and, and why not? And, but they've got a long list. And so, you know, it's, it's kind of like waiting for rides at Six Flags or Disney. You've got to wait and you got to take your turn and you kind of take your ticket and, you know, you could be second in line, you could be 10th in line. So it's so dependent. And I guess if you want to do a shelf life study, a nine month study, that's it. And as a scientist, you know how long does it take to not only do the study, but get the data, analyze, and have a, um, a good report to support specific claims, or yeah. even just a digestibility trial can be, it take a while. It doesn't come from just a specific amount of time, that study. There are all the analysis and everything else that comes after that, that 
it's going to for sure add some months to the eight to nine months animation. In a perfect world, yes. Um, but yeah, we've we've definitely had our hiccups. I've seen things be very extended. Um, just from you've got to hope and pray that everyone is working in the same motion. Yeah. Um, so nothing is going to hinder you or stop you up. It's time for our famous three. As a global leader in pet nutrition, ADM is always looking at what's next, taking a forward-looking view of the industry landscape and a comprehensive approach to developing innovative, science-backed foods, treats, and supplements so owners can take a proactive approach to their pet's wellness. Well, thank you very much, Stephanie, for sharing a little bit about your experience with different types of products. I'm sure your listener, they're going to have your contact. They can uh, ask you more questions and details about a specific products they're interested. Um, but to finish the podcast, I always like to ask two or three other questions uh, not specifically related to, to the topic. Uh, the first one that I want to ask you is a little bit related to supplements, but not product development, is do you give your dog or cat any supplements or do you... Do you purchase them? I do. Um, I have two older dogs. Um, so I have a, a, a pit bull dachshund and we like to call her a meatball, but now that she's getting older, she's more like a sausage. Um, you know, very long back, very tiny legs, big pit bull head and chest. And so she unfortunately was abused uh, for quite a few years before I adopted her and she's got some, some joint issues. So I've been keeping her on a joint supplement since I've gotten her. Um, you know, it's, it's a joint supplement that I, I was able to call the brand and ask them, you know, do you test for heavy metals in, in your fish oil? Um, you know, because that's, that's something we do have to think about with fish oil. It, it's great EPA and DHA anti-inflammatory benefits, but you know, sometimes those tricky heavy metals gets, you know, in the fish oil and I don't want to, Again, give her something that I think is doing well, but then I'm actually giving her micro doses of heavy metals and going to cause another issue down the road. Um, I also have, we adopted a, a three-legged beagle. Her name is Barley Hops and she is a little bit older. So she's, she's turning seven. And in addition to keeping her weight really ideal, you know, just to help with any joint issues, I'm also giving her a joint support. Um, because you know that back leg is overcompensating yeah uh, for what you know another leg that should be there and so she gets a joint supplement as well um they get the same one i think it's easier um they're roughly the same size so they're still within that same you know feeding guideline um and i feed my dogs twice a day so i give them you know their morning breakfast and then at night is when i add the supplement um i think it's a little bit more easier to feed them at night. Um, you know, we're all sitting down for family dinner, they're eating. And so <laughs> it's a little bit more calmer as opposed to the morning, yeah. trying to get toddler off to school and hoping my dogs eat and they don't eat each other's <laughs> and then they're eating more. Oh, well, that's, that's very cool because you have that uh, experience formulating the supplements and then you have the mindset on your buying supplements for your pet. And as you said, calling the brand, as you mentioned before, that pet owners can do as well. Anyone can call the brand. They, most brands are very transparent and honest. So yeah. uh, we should take good advantage of it and ask questions uh, when we want. So people ask too many questions that are not even related, but <laughs> that's even another talk I've <laughs> about, <laughs> about that. But, uh, my last question is, as you've done a lot of product development, uh, what is one big lesson that you learned from it and can be applied to industry setting, personal setting, any kind of uh, lesson that you learned from being a, working as a product developer? Oh man, there's been so many lessons I have learned. Um, a lot of, of, you know, trial by fire, um, you know, especially when you're venturing into these new formats, um, you know, does the texture feed okay? Does it smell okay? Are owners okay with this, um, you know, this new format? Are veterinarians okay with this new format? It's new. Do they feel like it has enough evidence and science behind it? So with all of that, there's been lots of challenges, but I think, you know, first and foremost is compromise. Um, you know, I, I never think you should compromise on nutrition, but when you start adding in these extra claims or formats or, you know, bag types or 
other things, all the bells and whistles that go along with it, there's a compromise between how many bells and whistles you can add and a cost. So I always make sure I'm open and transparent with whoever I'm working with. Like we can, we'll give you this, you know, kind of top layer, you know, tier gold standard. Um, and then you can let me know if the pricing is right, if we need to remove a bell um, or maybe a bell and a whistle and get the price a little bit more tailored. Um, and then also, I think this is really good. I'm not a, a Palatin expert. Um, you know, I, I, I know the Palatins that we use. I know how they perform. But when you start mixing them in with maybe novel proteins or different fats that pet owners are wanting, how does that feed? And making sure that the Palatin is, is spot on or, you know, the, the taste is spot on if they decide not to use a Palatin. Um, so you can go through a lot of iterations and these dogs will just still not like it or they will love it. Um, and you're like, I, you know, <laughs> is this going to work on the next formulas or the next line skews or, you know, how is this going to react to this protein or this fat or even this cook? Um, so I, I think palatant and making sure something is super tasty is always really a, a strong learning but also you're at the fine line between not making it so tasty that all our free feeders out there are just gobbling it down and just consuming so much. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a fine balance. I've, I've learned a lot about that, um, again, by trial and fire. Um, but I think that's always a really good one. Yeah, no, the compromise is a very good advice as well. We cannot have everything in one, so you have to <laughs> compromise something for sure. Thank you very much, Stephanie, for being with us here. I hope you can come back for a future podcast. And thank you again. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for having me. And I would love to come back on any topic. Thank you.